Welcome to Psychology 3325, a course on theories of personality. I'm Dr. Edward Sheridan, the instructor for this course. put out by Allen and Bacon. And you may be interested in knowing that actually Dr. Allen got his PhD at the University of Houston uh, about 30 years ago and has been at other universities since, but is certainly uh, one of the leading personality theorists in the country. Also, you can log on to WebCT, which will be important for this course since material will be there. In our, uh, in our course, we're, we're going to talk about something that's, that's very personal to all of you, and that is uh, personality theory. And everyone here probably, uh, to some extent, already feels you know a lot about personality. And, uh, and there are a lot of factors uh, you know, in one's life that, that will contribute to it. For example, uh, I was thinking in my own life, what are some of the factors uh, that, that are relevant to probably how I look at personality theory. Uh, I was the first child in my family to be born in the United States. And my parents were, were both uneducated peasant immigrants. Uh, they grew up uh, in Ireland. Uh, they both grew up in homes that had no electricity, no running water, had dirt floors. Uh, when uh, an early memory I have is that when I was a child, I remember my father got very excited about the fact that I was graduating from grade school. And I asked him, you know, why are you so excited? And he said, well, he'd been thinking about his, his brothers and his cousins and his grandparents and his great-grandparents, and he had decided that I was the first child in the history of the family who ever graduated from grade school. And at the same time, my father, who only went to fifth grade, he was literate, my mother was literate, but they didn't go to school beyond grade five. But it, it tells you a lot about opportunities in life, and you'll see that in these theories. For example, my father was very bright. And so from early in my life, my father made the message clear to me in, in a very loving, gentle way that he would always see that I could get as much education as, uh, as I would desire. But he also kind of planted the seed, you know, probably you'll want to get a doctorate. And, you know, this is from a man who drove a bus for 30 years, uh, was a union organizer, and yet, uh, you know, understood uh, the value of education and understood uh, what it really meant to uh, have opportunities in life. And so I grew up in union halls uh, in Detroit, uh, learned a lot about blue-collar workers. Uh, I've always been very close to people, uh, you know, who are working because that's the environment I came from. I grew up on a street in which the parents of all of my playmates, almost all, spoke a language other than English. I mean, people just in the block around me, there were people who spoke French, people who spoke German, people who spoke uh, Lithuanian, spoke Polish, spoke Yiddish. I actually grew up thinking that parents speak a different language than their kids. And, and what's interesting nowadays, we think that it's the kids who speak a different language than the parents. But uh, when I came on this campus, for example, I mean, this was very comfortable for me when you walk around the campus and you hear people speaking many different languages uh, because that's an environment I grew up in. So I didn't know that that was unusual. And again, you will find as we study personality theory that many of the experiences of the theorists uh, will have an influence on uh, how they see life. Now, we're going to talk about personality theory. Personality theory actually is one of the few 
uh, areas in psychology that is peculiar to psychology. That is, the scientific study of personality is something that we, we do in psychology, and other disciplines do not do that. Now, as you well know, uh, poets feel that they uh, are interested in personality. Philosophers feel that they are interested in personality, and they are. But they do not study it scientifically. You simply get their impressions. In psychology, we really do try to develop a, a scientific approach to how, how personality theory actually works. Now, we probably should start by getting some sense from the class. I mean, what, what do you think are the elements of personality? I mean, what should, uh, what should we be studying in this class? What do you think is important about personality? Surely you've thought of it. We'll start by assuming everybody has a personality. But what do you think are the elements we should be studying in this class? What's important? Anything come to mind? Do you think your biology is important? Do you think that genetics plays a role in, in personality theory? Lots of people want to get personality theory down to only genetics. And if we knew enough about your biological systems, we would actually know uh, all about you. And you think that's possibly true? You're shaking your head. So you think biology won't explain it all? Ah, very important, yes. So you've got biology on the one hand, and biology, of course, would take up like genetics, but it also would take up things like uh, characteristics that you're born with, that, that is your own physiology. Uh, if you're uh, five feet three, probably you're never going to dunk a basketball. Uh, there are some things that your physique mean you cannot aspire to. Uh, so there will be some limitations on the basis of your physiology. There will be some things you inherit uh, genetically. But as this gentleman mentions, uh, your environment's going to play a big role in the kind of personality you develop. What else do you think is going to be important? This is a required course in psychology. I assume you're psychologists. Uh, what else do you think is going to be important in developing personality? Sure. Ah, thank you. Yeah. One of the big arguments is nature versus nurture. Uh, that is, how much of what you are is determined by what you're born with, and how much of what you are is determined by your life experiences. And your life experiences are more than your environment. And you'll find that your life experiences uh, also include, like, you know, your own personal motivation. It includes how you integrate events that are to you. Uh, it, it, it involves your ability to take various life experiences and either integrate them in some way or perhaps not integrate them in some way and, and therefore be confused. In addition to environment, which can be things like school, uh, work, other opportunities, etc. A big variable, and a variable that many of our theorists will focus on, are interpersonal relationships. What happens between you and significant other people in your life is really going to make a difference in the kind of personality you develop. And, and you want to think about that uh, because hopefully as this course goes on, you will get some insights yourself into the way your own personality developed. Now, there are, there are popular things that, that we say. Uh, she has a nice personality. How many have heard that statement? What do we mean when we say she has a nice personality? Easy to get along with. Okay, easy to get along with. It's a very positive thing. She has a nice personality. Anything else that you think about when she has a nice personality? Okay, outgoing person, nice conversationalist, 
uh, desirable person. Okay. The opposite then, of course, is if she doesn't have a nice personality, then she's not a desirable person. Uh, the tendency being to think she has a nice personality, somebody you would like to be with. Uh, so when we attribute negatives, that we're not only attributing negatives, but we're actually making a value judgment that a person really isn't so desirable. Now, because life is never as simple as I just made it, when I was young, the statement, she has a nice personality, was not a good thing. Because, it, it, depending on who told you this, but if your mother told you that her friend has a daughter who has a nice personality, and you should ask her out, what you immediately knew is this young woman is unattractive, not sexy, probably not fun, and you've got to figure a way to avoid this personality. So here we are saying that someone has a nice personality, but it's a code word for all kinds of other things. So the social context in which we talk about personality is going to have some meaning. And, and you want to be uh, you know, very aware of what are people really trying to say when they make uh, this statement. Now, since our course is going to be on theories of personality, we need to talk about how do theories evolve, because they really come quite different ways. One way is that what we call inductive theories. And an inductive theory is developed by scientists, by psychologists, who go out and they gather a lot of data on the personalities of people. They give them lots of tests, perhaps make lots of observations. Uh, and after they have a large pool of data, they begin looking for commonalities, like what comes up a lot. And it's these commonalities, then, that become the focus for research. Later, we will talk about things like introversion, extroversion, which is one of the very popular things that has evolved from gathering a lot of data. You find that people are motivated from totally from internal variables all the way to being very influenced by what goes on outside. But what happens is you gather a lot of data. You get a lot of characteristics of people. And then you begin to try to build a theory from all of these data. That is not the way most theories develop. Most theories are what we call deductive theories. And what happens in deductive theories is that you make some observations about people, and once you've made the observations, then what you do is you try to build a theory that kind of universalizes your observations uh, to most people, if not everyone. Uh, because the early theorists we're going to discuss were clinicians, you're going to see the deductive theories uh, are by far the, the most common ones. And also, very importantly, uh, you want to keep in mind, because clinicians were evolving personality theories, many of the most important observations that they made were of patients. So they were looking at someone that we might consider abnormal and trying to answer the question, why is this person abnormal? And having made observations about someone being abnormal, they then try to, to look at things and say, OK, what happened to this person uh, that this person behaves this way? And what needed to happen to them so that they could have been normal? So the deductions that are being made aren't even from observing uh, a large population of people who are normal, but rather observing patients in an office who are abnormal and then trying to deduct how all of that occurred. When we do correlational studies, what we do is we try to find variables that if, if one variable exists, the other exists. Now, the danger, of course, is sometimes people begin to think the correlations are causal. And often they are. You know, for example, if you went out uh, of your house and you find the streets are all wet, uh, and you, you assume it rained recently, well, there's a high correlation between raining and the streets being wet. But it is a correlation, because there are other reasons for why the street might be wet. I mean, it might be the day that the city sends through trucks that wash the streets. So the streets might be wet in the same way that they would be if it had rained, except that's not the way they got wet. So, but it's pretty 
predictive. I mean, if the streets are wet, you can probably bet that it's highly likely that uh, the, it rained recently. On the other hand, if you want to find a correlation between, let's say in basketball, between foul shooting and having brown eyes, there, 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 may be, I mean, there may be such a correlation. Someone may find that, that people who have higher rates of making foul throws have brown eyes. It's absolutely irrelevant correlation. It has nothing to do with the event. Uh, whereas if you had used a test, let's say, of eye-hand coordination, and you found that people who have very good eye-hand coordination also are good foul shooters, that might be relevant. But the thing you always want to be aware of when someone tells you there's a high correlation uh, between events, that does not mean that, it's, uh, that there's a causal relationship. It just means if one event occurs, another one is likely to occur. Now, the other way that we study personality, of course, is, is the case method. And you're going to see a lot of that, especially in, the, in, in psychoanalysis, where you take an individual and then you take another individual, et cetera, and you study them in depth, trying to learn a great deal about how people develop from studying one individual's growth and another individual's growth. And, and of course, the case study method does gives you, give you the uh, opportunity to study people over a long time, and that can be very helpful. Now, what I do hope happens in our course is that you end up being very reflective about your own development because I think that will help you to understand the material that we're going to, to deal with. And, and as you go along, uh, some things you will reject outright, which is fine because they're not true. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you might find some of the things that we talk about actually ring a bell with you. They may not ring a bell with the person next to you, but that's okay because we're not going to find that any theory really is a universal theory. So what becomes important as we try to understand people is to understand the population of people we're talking about and to understand how, how this affects you personally. Now, the first theory we're going to talk about is called psychoanalytic theory. And can you bring that up? Okay. Ah, we're all set. Okay. Now, psychoanalytic theory has really had a, a profound impact on our culture. And it has influenced essentially every uh, psychological theory that we're going to talk about. Even theories that are very, very different, but what you will find is that the authors all refer back to Freud. They refer back to why uh, their theory is not like his or how their theory differs from his. Now, you need to understand through the context of when psychoanalysis started, which, which started you know, right at the turn of the 20th century. That is, in the early 1900s, this man, Sigmund Freud, develops this theory which explodes the myth that childhood is a period of calm, that, that little infants are just cuddly, uh, nothing is going on inside them, and that um, you have to wait till their adolescence before they really have a lot of feeling. Uh, now, as I just mentioned, though, Freud developed his theory about uh, development from patients. That is, he would listen to patients tell him about their anxieties, about their struggles, and then he would have them go back and try to explore their early life trying to figure out what happened in the life of this person that causes the person to have the feelings that they have. And, and from that, he deduced this theory. Now, what's important for you to, to be aware of is that Freud's extreme really made it difficult for people to understand what he meant. For example, Freud felt that people are governed by what he called the pleasure principle. The pleasure principle essentially says that left unbridled by anything else, what a person would do is to simply seek his or her own gratification. And that actually 
that's the most basic thing in you. The most basic thing is that you, your life is instinctual. And if you could, all you would do is to try to have these instincts gratified. Now, so everybody in Freud's theory, of course, essentially was very selfish. All people wanted to do was to have their own pleasure. Now, what really blew people away, though, is that when Freud got into this, and as I say, he started off with the idea of pleasure, but then he began trying to focus on getting people in touch with extreme pleasure, and, and he proposed that the, the ultimate pleasure is an orgasm. Therefore, his theory became very focused on sexuality, and specifically on the penis and the clitoris, with the idea being that ultimately the most intense gratification you can have is an orgasm. Therefore, uh, his theory often talks about sexuality, very focused uh, on penises and on clitorises. And, it, and as we get on in this theory, you'll see uh, what a big role this plays. What you need to understand, though, is that that's not really, uh, his theory wasn't that narrow. So in order to understand the theory, you've got to f understand that we're really talking about a person being driven by seeking pleasure. All right, now, you'll notice this diagram we have up here called the iceberg concept. Now, what Freud believed about your psyche is that most of your psyche is unknown to you. And so he likened it to an iceberg, where most of an iceberg, as you know, if you're out in deep waters, you can't see most of an iceberg. You, in fact, you can see very little of it. And so he said, that's your unconscious. Most of what goes on in your life is driven by things that you're not even aware of. And, and you need to know that because these things are influencing you, although you, you, you are not aware of that. Now then, he had two other structures that he thought were important. One of them he called the preconscious. Now, as I just said, the unconscious is that part that you can't recall even if someone asks you. The preconscious referred to that part of your personality that you did have access to, you're just not thinking about it right now. So preconscious refers to things like if somebody asks you, you know, when is your birthday, you could remember that, although you're not thinking about it now. Uh, where did you go to grade school? Uh, you know, a lot of things, what's your mother's name? Uh, you're not thinking about any of those things right now, but you could easily recall events if you needed to. Now then, he put down the conscious, and by the way, I should have developed this a uh, little better in the sense that it, it looks like a good part of the iceberg is, is conscious. That's not really true. That should be a smaller area because the truth is most uh, of what you're conscious of is very limited. But, uh, but he posited that that's part of your personality, part of your psyche. What we tend to think about, though, is that it's those events that we're thinking about right now and those feelings we're having right now. And those feelings and thoughts and experiences that can, we can remember are what make up our personality. And Freud is saying, no, that's a very modest part of your personality. There is much more of your personality that is totally unconscious that you don't know about. So what happened is he developed this thing where he had many uh, constructs, concepts, and stages that we will talk about that are used to explain uh, how you have developed the way you have. Now, the theory uh, that Freud has is called an instinctual one. And this means that in his mind, we are primarily motivated by biological instincts. And he said that our biological instincts have an energy about them. This energy is constantly pushing to find expression. And the energy that he's talking about, he gave the title libido to, L-I-B-I-D-O. And Freud sometimes is referred to as having a libido theory. And in his words, or his thoughts, libido meant uh, the forces in you that are in the unconscious that we just looked at that are trying to find expression. Now, what 
It happened interestingly with Freud is later on in, in his life, he began realizing, you know, there, there probably are other instincts. Uh, I can't account for everything with just this libido. So he came up with uh, what he called death instincts. And he never really got to, to defining them very well, but he, he talked about them because it was the only way he could explain the aggression that he saw in people. So he, he, he thought people became very destructive, that this was an instinctual thing, that people were uh, destructive. He doesn't account for it very much. And you will find in our theory that most of the time we're really going to be talking about uh, libido and about the instinctual theories. Now, when we, we look at this model we have of the psyche, we also end up, let's see, with a structure that he came up with in order to explain what happens with all this energy that, that you have inside you that is trying to find expression. And, and so he, he, he gave us certain terms. Many of you have probably heard these terms. Uh, first of all, he said that that unconscious energy, that libido that is trying to seek expression, we will call the id. The id is absolutely irrational. It is totally pleasure driven. If your id instincts were allowed to express themselves, all you would do is to seek pleasure for yourself. And he said, all of this is unconscious. You don't even know this is happening. In other words, much of what is motivating you is totally outside of your consciousness. Now then he came up with another construct and he called it the superego. And the superego is that part of your psyche that governs the way in which you relate to your environment. And the superego is developed mostly from your interactions with your family. And as you will see in this, some of it is unconscious, some of it is preconscious. Uh, what that means is that you have developed the way in which you relate to your world by what you have been told and what you have learned from significant other people at when you were a child. Some of that you probably could reflect upon and realize goes on. Some of that you won't realize goes on. But what he said was that what occurs is when you want to seek gratification, you find out from your parents you can't do that. And if you do that, you won't be loved. So in order for you to, to not be rejected by the family, in order for you to function efficiently and effectively in society, you actually make certain decisions based on uh, the threat that, will hap that bad things will happen to you. And so you develop what is called the superego. <clears throat> and that causes your behavior to be good behavior. Now, there are any number of people, when you read them, they will talk about the superego and they'll use it, they'll say it's like a conscience. It's not really like a conscience. And that's a distinction you want to make. The only reason, in terms of Freud's theory, for why you are doing something that everybody says is okay, for why you're being polite, for example, is because if you're polite, people will be nice to you. And people will be good to you. And no, people won't hurt you. Uh, so you have learned that you get gratification from being polite, not that you really care about somebody else. This is a very, very person, internal driven theory. Now in conscience, which is really a philosophical term, we say a person has a conscience because they've actually developed some real moral values. And the person truly believes that it is better uh, to be kind than to be hostile. Uh, it is better to give things to others than to seek everything for yourself. Uh, that concept, you know, is, is a very uh, religious, spiritual, uh, kind of socially determined concept. Uh, it's one that means there are real values inside you. The superego is not like that. The superego is still, it, it's seeking gratification. And what you see in this is that uh, 
in order to get gratification, sometimes you have to be nice. But that's not really what you'd like to do. Now then you see, he posits, there is an ego. And for Freud, the ego is that part of your psyche that is used to integrate uh, the messages from uh, the environment, the messages from your past, uh, your superego, etc. And it's used to relate in, in the, the world in which you live. Uh, it also helps you to avoid expressing any id impulses that would be unacceptable and might cause people to be rejecting. Now, from there, what happened was that when Freud was, was trying to figure out how uh, the superego develops and what are some of the things that, that go into it, he came up with a concept you'll read about called the ego ideal. And the ego ideal develops as a result of an individual uh, recognized, seeking to be recognized for certain behaviors. For example, mom and dad point out to you they would like you to be a certain way. You, as you grow up, you begin to recognize, especially now we're talking first or second year of life uh, and on, you begin to recognize that when you do certain things, that is when you behave a certain way, mom and dad are real pleased. They, do, they say nice things to you. Uh, they don't shout at you. Uh, perhaps they hug you. Uh, they do all kinds of things. And you develop a sense that there are a group of behaviors that if I do those things, a lot of nice things happen to me. And that becomes my ego ideal. And my ego ideal, of course, is that which mom and dad have mostly reinforced. Now, with the superego, if you think about it the way I'm describing it, so that you're thinking, well, actually, uh, most of what he's saying is that mom and dad set up a certain group of rules and you do those things, so most children should be just like their parents and most children should be just like each other. Well, Freud knew that wasn't true, so he had to figure out, well, what goes on that causes people to be different? So what he determined was that what happens, actually, is the child projects onto the parents what the child thinks uh, the parents want. And different children in the family may make different judgments about what it is that parents, grandparents, other significant caregivers really want. And then he said they introject, that is, they take into themselves into their value systems, those things that they have projected onto the parents. So when you've got the oldest child, which often, as we know in our theories of childhood development, often the oldest child is the one that gets the most rules, and the oldest child is the one the parents spend the most time setting limits on, etc. That child comes up with a whole group of things that he or she is supposed to do that actually help them uh, to feel that, uh, that they're going to be loved. The second child comes along, and the second child doesn't make those same observations because perhaps the parents aren't making so many rules, the parents are feeling more comfortable, uh, they're allowing the child more freedom. So the second child projects onto the parents what he or she thinks the parents want, introjects that into themselves, and so they develop a different kind of superego. They develop a different sense of what are the things that I need to do in order to feel loved. Now, this psychic structure is very important, and you'll find that these terms get used a lot as we will go on with other people, but they will define them differently. Is this clear? Are you finding that? Okay. Now, we're going to go on then, and we're going to talk about a really fascinating part of Freud's theory. The, let me just point out a couple of things, though, I, I should have mentioned in this. When uh, you see that, uh, that we're, we're talking about psychic structure, uh, remember, and th this is a hard concept to grasp at times, 
most of what we're talking about is not conscious to the person. That's the id. It's simply being driven by these very primitive instincts. The thing that is least significant in our life in the sense uh, of what motivates us is our conscious, which almost, of course, runs diametrically opposite of what you think, because normally you think those things that I'm thinking about are what drive me. And you want to keep in mind that the superego is, is very, very significant in the sense that it controls many of the things that you do uh, so that you can be loved. Now, what happened with Freud was that he began to, to see that in uh, it, working with patients, that people have different ways of defending against their id impulses, against the expression of libido. And so he called these ego defense mechanisms. And these are ways in which we behave so that we're allowed to express our feelings but not to experience anxiety. So one of the things that you want to keep in mind is that anxiety is the basic thing that people are trying to avoid uh, when they're using ego defense mechanisms. That is, the ego doesn't want to feel uncomfortable, doesn't want to feel threatened, and so it finds ways not to feel threatened. Now, you'll see here, of course, Freud thought a lot of anxiety in your life came from early traumatic experiences. That is, something happened to you, and a lot of anxiety was created. Uh, and you don't want that experience again. So you've got to find ways to protect yourself so that that kind of feeling doesn't come up again. Now, in many books that you will read on this, you will find that the authors uh, make a mistake in trying to describe to you what an ego defense mechanism is really like. And by the way, I should mention here, any time that you find I say something and your book says something different, trust me, take what I've told you. This is one of those examples. Often, repression, which we have in this model, is given as an ego defense mechanism. It is not an ego defense mechanism. It is part of every ego defense mechanism. What happens in your psychic structure is that there is some impulse that is trying to seek expression. And it's not, it's going to make you anxious. It's too primitive. It's something that's not allowed. So the first thing that happens, according to Freud, is you repress this instinct. You drive it back into your unconscious. It is making you anxious, so you don't want it to come forward. However, what he would say is, once you've repressed it, it's still seeking some kind of expression. And so there has to be a way for you to express that psychic energy, but not in the way that it was intended. So he said, you develop defense mechanisms. And the defense mechanisms allow you to express certain feelings without uh, having any kind of negative consequences. Now, the truly successful defense mechanism acts to prevent us from even knowing we have a conflict. So that if defense mechanisms work really well, you behave and, and you express whatever it is you're going to express, you don't even know that at the root of this behavior is actually a much more primitive feeling that you're trying to avoid. Now, if you think about uh, things in your own life, uh, there are all kinds of, of defense mechanisms that go on where uh, you see in children, where they, they do something that really isn't uh, socially acceptable uh, and you see children who find ways to do something that is socially acceptable, but if you look a little further, you'll realize there's a more primitive instinct here. I was thinking one of mine. When I was a kid, I remember that uh, my sister, who was younger than I am by a couple of years, uh, was born, and my, my sister uh, was very ill early in her life, so she obviously got a lot of attention. And I remember my parents telling me about this. 
Well, some of my earliest memories are that when people came over to our house, I was eager to sell my sister. Now, I grew up in a family in which uh, we had very little money, very, very poor family. And, uh, and I knew my parents uh, needed money. Uh, my father, because he was a union organizer, got fired lots of times, so often the family barely had enough to get by on. So money was a big thing in our, our life. Now, I also, as an adult, reflecting back, realized that when my sister was born and she was ill and getting all this attention, obviously I, who had been the only child up to then, didn't want my sister around. So what did I devise? I would tell people who came over to the house I was willing to sell my sister for a quarter, which I thought was a lot of money. But I also noticed that people seemed to have quarters, so perhaps they would give me a quarter, which I could then could have shown my parents, look, I am also earning money, and uh, I am doing something good for the family. So it was easy for me to convince myself that actually I'm doing a nice thing. In reality, of course, my real motivation was, I gotta get rid of this little sister. Uh, look at all the attention she's getting. Look at all the gratification she's taking away from me. And, and in, when you, you do that well, and I can remember back when I w was younger, I mean, I just thought this was neat. And of course, everybody in the family thought it was neat. So when people came over to visit, they would always ask me these questions about how much would you sell your sister for. And I kept saying a quarter. And, uh, and they would say that's too much, but I, I knew I shouldn't come down. So this went on all the time. And I ended up getting a lot of attention from this. Uh, only when I was older did I reflect upon this and begin to recognize actually what I was really expressing was the fact that I was upset that I was no longer getting the attention that I felt that I needed. Now, there's, there are a lot of, uh, of ways that ego defense mechanisms get expressed and I'm gonna try to, to go through some of them. The, the concept is always the same. That is, impulse comes forward, you rationalize, uh, excuse me, you, you, you repress, that is, you push out of uh, your consciousness uh, this impulse, which you really can't deal with, and then the next thing that happens is you have to find some way to express these feelings. And what we will do in our next class is we will begin to talk about different kinds of defense mechanisms and, and I hope you will be able to reflect yourself and think about how do I, you know, what kinds of things do I use? And when I give you some of these examples, uh, it may help you to become kind of aware of how you handle your own anxieties, uh, how you've tried to, to present yourself in such a way that people will feel very positive about you and then you move on from there. Okay, so we'll take that in our next session.